them up to the Lord this week as you go to your prayer time. Well, let's take our Bibles to Philippians 4 this, this afternoon, Philippians 4, verse 8. And um, Jack, did I turn this thing on? Okay. There it is. Okay. I, it didn't sound right. I just want to make sure I got it on before we got started. Philippians 4, 8. Uh, looking at this thought, what's on your mind? And we're going to be here tonight and one more a week just on this one verse. I just think it's so important that we understand what's going on in our society, what's going on with us, um, in, in what, um, what we can do to, to fight the, 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 what's going on in our thinking. Because how we think affects who we are, how we behave, and all those things. And there's just an onslaught of ideas that are, that are put into our eyes and ears on a daily basis. And all those things can, can sort of cause our life to go one direction or the other. And so it's very important we understand what we're to be, what we're to be thinking on. Okay, so I just entitled this, uh, going through Philippians, but this verse here, I'm just taking a couple of weeks to go through it, and I've entitled the message is, What's on Your Mind? Philippians 4, 8, read with me, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. I'm going to say this again in a little bit, but notice that Paul is not saying, um, well, this is a verse of action. He's saying, he's not just saying, don't think about these other things. He's saying, these are some things to actively think on, put in your brain and let rattle around. So let's look at this tonight. Lord, we are uh, looking for your help, understanding the, the, the verses, and as we just look at a few more of the types of things we're supposed to be thinking on. Lord, help us to understand. I pray in a very practical way we'll apply this to our life, even this week. Lord, I pray that this week we'd make some changes in our media choices, in our time choices, in our thought choices uh, that would help us uh, to be better Christians. And I know every single person here uh, would, would have areas of life especially in their thought life, that, that could use your help. And so I pray for that. I pray for you to help us. And I pray for your help as I preach the message. And ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last time we saw the importance of our thoughts. And uh, we're just gonna, I'm going to remind you of some of that. Uh, the Bible says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so it's very true. What's on the inside of us is what we are. And we'll see that tonight with our second uh, type of thought that Paul wants us to focus on. But as we think in our heart, so is he. I don't know if I wrote, read this quote last week, but there, there was a quote, unknown author, but the quote is, the devil tempts all men, but the idle man tempts the devil. And if you think about that for just a second, if you don't keep busy in the things of the Lord, uh, you know, the, 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 the devil tempts everyone, but someone who has nothing to do, the devil's sure to give them something to do. And so it's important that we don't just dispel bad thoughts from our thought life, and we don't just dispel bad actions from our life in general, but it's important that we include good thoughts, replace good thoughts uh, in our life. And, and so I imagine it like a, a pot of stew. You know, if you ever eaten a good pot of stew, who's ready for the fall? Cooler temperatures? No? Oh, a couple of, I was like, up here you may not want the fall because this means winter is coming. Uh, I, get, I get that. We all pray for the fall in Texas. We're like, hey, we, we're ready for 60, 70 degree days. You know, we, we're loving the fall. Um, but yeah, you, you know, you'll get the pot of chili going, you'll get the pot of stew going. And, and what I've learned about that is, I mean, what you get out of that is what you put in, right? What goes into the pot changes the flavor. And, and so it's just like that. In our thought life, what we put in influences what comes out, you know? And uh, I, I was, I've got an example written down here a, a few years ago. Um, and th this has happened many times since then, but um, I'll, I'll be standing outside one of my kids' rooms. My daughter's is the example I wrote down here uh, that I remember. But it's kind of not standing out there eavesdropping. But, you know, you go by the hall and you can hear them in there. And I don't remember now, it's been a few years ago, I don't remember now which hymn she was humming. But one of my daughters was humming a hymn. Humming a hymn on her own, mid middle of the week. We didn't just get back from church or something. And it just, it just dawned on me, and I thought, something good has gone in to get that kind of result out. Now, I could also tell you about the times that I was walking by their room, and I could hear them strangling each other to death. And I could even, but I don't want to tell you about all that. I'll just tell you about the time she was humming a hymn. 
Um, because it, it, it's true. What, what goes in, you know, it, it manifests. It comes out. You, you may find yourself someday, uh, tomorrow maybe, and you're humming along with some hymn we sang today or whistling a, a hymn, or you might be thinking about a verse. And that's because something good has gone in there, it's taken up some residence there, and been allowed to sit in your mind for a bit, and it will come out. The opposite is also true. Negative things that go in, sinful things that go in, perverse things that go in, They'll find their way out somewhere. And as Christians, we might be good at hiding it, but it comes out in our attitude, our actions, our, 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 our private life before God, all of these things. Uh, it's important what goes in the eyes, what goes in the ears, what gets into the mind. First John 1, John warns us, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if our, uh, you know, we, we say, yes, we're, we're, we're a Christian, we have fellowship with God, but yet our walk is in darkness, he says we're lying. We're lying to ourselves, first of all. We're lying to others. Um, and in fact, in one verse, a couple verses after that, he says we even make him a liar because we're telling him he's not right and, and, and so on and so forth. So again, we can't you know, be a, a Christian. Well, we can be a Christian and, and think badly. We're not supposed to be um, walking in darkness if we are to have fellowship with Christ. We can't have both, I guess is what I'm saying. And the issue that I'm trying to tackle in these sermons here is that we've become a, a society of thought consumers rather than a society of thinkers. Now think about that. A thought consumer is someone who just consumes media. They just consume. In other words, we're letting, I'll just be blunt, we're letting the devices dictate our thinking and influence our thinking. And we, we consume uh, in our society today mass amounts of Various media. Some of it is good. A lot of it is bad. But what I'm telling you is I look out on our society today. It's not making us a better group of people. All this media that's, that's going on. It's not making us a better group of people. And so I said last week, we're in need of some mind cleansing. And, and Paul tells us that in Romans 12, that we should be transformed. How are we to be transformed? We're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So we're in need of mind renewal. Uh, we've got to relearn how to think. We've got to relearn to, to, to disband things from our mind that should not be there or to dis, disperse or dispel. Get rid of. We'll go with that. Get rid of. I don't think disband was right. We'll get rid of these thoughts that enter our mind. And really, we'll talk about that more next week. But Paul in this verse is teaching us or trying to teach us how to think differently. So I told you what the word means. It's logizomai, and it means uh, to think. Uh, and there's a couple of different ways that we think, and, and they're kind of linked together with arrows. The, there's three, it's really a three-pronged definition. The, the first one is to, um, to meditate on, to weigh something, or to consider something. So this is where we're just processing information. This, this, this information is coming in through maybe our eyes, our ears. Right now, you're sitting here, you're listening to me, hopefully, and, and, and those, these, these thoughts from the Bible are hopefully getting into the mind through your eyes, through your ears, and you're, and you're hopefully going to chew on those things. You're going to meditate on them. Uh, you're going to give them some time in your brain uh, to, to sit there for a little while. And that's one thing, the way that it means to think. Then, again, connected with an arrow. So that kind of leads to the next one, which is the, the type of a, a thinking that involves our judgment. To suppose, to deem, or to judge. So we take those things that are uh, kicking around in our brain. I said it's like a game of Atari, you know, a Pong. It's like the little things are moving back and forth and the thought is bouncing around in there. That, that causes us to, well, to, to be able to make certain judgments about our worldview and about what's going on, what we, what we think. Um, and then that flows through the third part of thinking, which has to do with our ability to then take those thoughts and proceed with action. So to determine, to purpose, and to decide. And so that word, if you read all the definitions and really study out the word, what you'll find is what we think in our minds, what we consider, what we meditate on. Uh, I, I liken it to like chewing beef jerky, uh, met, you know, the cows chewing the cud. It's like taking that thought and really giving it time, really giving it time to, to let it sink in and, and hopefully understand it. Um, what, what happens there is it causes us to make certain judgments, right, wrong, uh, it causes us to, to come up with certain conclusions, and then those conclusions will affect how we then live our lives. Does that make sense? So there's really three ways in which thinking affects us. And so it's very important that we um, get the first one right. 
Because if the first one isn't right, it flows into the others. Um, I often ask the question, I think I have in here a couple times, but you, you may have thought but to yourself before, how, how have we gotten to a place in the world where a good percentage of the world sees whatever, this awful, wicked thing, and thinks it's okay? You know, how, would you, how do we get to a place where people don't realize that, you know, what, just name whatever, it, you, we could name a bunch, I'm trying not to get on the, the hot button issue so we don't get off on a rabbit trail, it just, how, how is it that we, we look at something and we think, or, or we just obviously know that's wrong, but there's a good percentage of people who's like, no, that's not wrong, it's fine. I'm telling you, there's, some, there's been thoughts resonating in the brain. It's, called, it's flowed down to their decision center. They've started making some judgments and conclusions based on those thoughts. And then that's, uh, that's lived out in action. And, and they, they can come to a place where, uh, well, the Bible would say their, um, well, their, their mind has, has become seared or, or uh, you know, they're, they're unable really to see the truth because um, of, of the depravity, how, how far they have gone from the truth. And so, again, it matters what we put in. It all starts with what goes in. I mean, that's it. You don't get a delicious pot of stew by putting bad stuff in, ever. Just ever. It just doesn't work. Um, so what you put in, it, it will produce a product. And Jesus taught this, Matthew 15, 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. Well, why did I say that? Oh, I hate to tell you, it came forth from the heart. I mean, that's it. Why was I so hateful to my brother? Why was I, so, whatever it is, whatever. Well, because it came forth from the heart. However, uh, on the opposite side of the coin, when we put good things in, <coughs> it keeps us from that because what comes, what's in the heart comes out. So Psalm 119, thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin. It gets into our heart by going through our mind. We excuse ourselves from this truth, but I, I, I know I said it all last week, but um, we excuse ourselves because we think as Christian, you know, really astute, mature Christian people, that we can watch whatever we want, that we can listen to whatever we want, that we can uh, have whatever sort of media and entertainment around us that we want, and somehow still we're going to be pure and, and we're going to be able to keep a pure walk before God. Jesus says that's not true. He says the light of the body is the eye. The, the, the entrance to the mind is that eye. There's these gates on our, on our face that allow stuff to go in. Our eyes, our ears. And, and, and those things that are going in are causing thoughts. Those thoughts are causing judgments. Those judgments are causing actions. And that is what the Lord has warned us about uh, over and over and over. So we need to make sure, if, if we're going to please the Lord in our thought life, and if we're going to please the Lord really in our Christian life, our walk, our thought life has to be sorted out. And so Paul is saying, there's a lot of things we can think on, but let me give you a list, okay? He says, whatsoever things are true. And I dealt with this one in detail last week, so I'm not really going to really re-preach that. But, but there's a lot of things. Can we just agree there's a lot of things that aren't true? A lot of media we, we, we read, we, a lot of things we watch. A lot of rumors that we hear, right? There's a lot of stuff out there that's untrue. And, and I, I, I want to call your attention again to the fact that the devil, Satan, he is a liar, Jesus said, and the father of it. So, so you would expect in this world, which is, uh, the again, he's the prince of the power of the air. So in this world where there's just spiritual wickedness all around us, you could just understand this world is full of lies, full of lies. Paul says don't, we don't have time to think on those lies. We don't have time to let those things that we don't know to be true uh, saturate our minds. And, and again, we, we talked about it last week. There, there's people on this earth who just have got to a place because the world is so um, inundated with lies. That there's people who just think there is no truth. You know, there's no truth. No, there's no actual truth. We, we just have to decide. Well, that would be against the teaching of the Scripture. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, 
Psalm 33 says, for, for, for the word of the Lord is right. All his works are done in truth. So there is truth, all right? Now, we're going to move on to the second word tonight, and really this is where we pick up on the message. And we're, trying, we're going to get through several of these words, not going to spend a long time on either any of them. But I want you to take this verse, and I hope that you're trying to memorize it. Maybe you have by now, maybe you have. I want you to try to take this verse and use this verse as a filter for your thinking. This will help you. Just use this verse as a filter for your thinking. So again, if something is not true or you don't know that it's true, then it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not valuable for us to think about it. Now we're going to move on to the second word, the second part of our filter, whatsoever things are honest. Now, as you look at the words true and honest, you might be tempted to say, well, Paul has just repeated himself. But honest is, it, again, um, if you're saying, well, be honest, you're saying don't tell an untruth. So the words are, are similar, they're synonyms. But what Paul is getting at here, if you, if you study the word, what you'll find is it's not just um, the, the, the things are like true or false objectively. <coughs> this word honest means that now we're dealing with the character of whatever that we're um, thinking of. So it's wrapped up, the word honest is wrapped up in the word honorable, okay? Similar words, honest, honorable. So when a judge walks out, they say, behold, the honorable judge, Judy. That's the only one I can think of. Sorry. And maybe that's a bad example. I don't know Judge Judy. Okay. But we call them honorable. You know what we're saying? They're trustworthy. Okay. That what we're saying is what we see on the outside is what we are getting on the inside. The inside is the same as the outside. It's a, it's a character thing. So, so when you say this, is that true? Is that honest? Is that honorable? Now, we're really talking about the inner integrity of something, the moral character. I was listening to a message preached by Lou Baldwin. Some of you may know who he is, but he said this, reputation is what man thinks about us. Integrity is what God knows is true about us. Now, just pause for a second. Reputation is what man thinks about us. Um, integrity is what God knows is true about us. Can we, you don't have to say anything out loud, but can you understand that sometimes your reputation and your integrity are not necessarily the same? People have this, you know, really rosy picture of who we are. Oh, yeah, they're this, per, they're, they're just a shining saint. And meanwhile, we've got unconfessed sin or we've got, you know, we got thinking God knows. And God's like, hey, just put that mask back on, you know. But, but, but again, uh, God knows our inner integrity. So when we talk about this thing of being honest, we're talking about the real you. What's on the inside? Your character is honest when it is the same on the inside and the outside. In other words, who we really are is who we are when we're all by ourselves between us and the Lord. That's who we really are. When no one is watching, when we're not concerned about reputation, but it's just all truth and we know it and God knows it, that's who we are. Honesty is when that person matches the person on the outside. And here's the issue with thinking. Thinking affords us a good amount of privacy, right? Have you ever been, uh, I, I hate to ask these kinds of questions because it reveals that, you know, y'all are such sinners. Okay, and I don't mean to do that. No, me. <laughs> you ever been talking to someone and you're smiling, but you're like, man, I wish they'd quit so I could go. Yeah. I, you know you have. Just, that's not honest, is it? That's di something different going on in here than's going on right here, you know? Okay, have you ever, you're on your way to church and you get into a little spat in the car? I mean, you're just spatting away. We don't fight, right? As Christians, we spat. So we're spatting. And you walk to church, and all of a sudden it's like, ah, oh, hey, brother, so-and-so. It's so good. It's praise the Lord. I'm so glad that you're here today. God is good. It's not honest, right? There's a different thing going on in here, or maybe inside the car, versus what we, we have out here. Now, by the way, don't bring your spat into the church. I, I, I think there's probably some practical teaching we could do there, too. Let me just see, let me, here's where we boil it down. 
And, I, and I'm just telling you, we, we all got to work on our, th- our thinking. We all got to work on our honesty. You know, we want to be that person that we imagine ourselves to be that God wants us to be. That's who we want to be. It, it, we don't want to, I don't want to fake through the Christian life. I don't, I don't have the energy for that. Uh, so we, we got to work on this, but let me, let me say it this way. If an unsaved person, okay, picture an unsaved person. If they could somehow put a little helmet on and see what was going on in your mind, would it lead them toward Christ or away from Christ? It's something to think about. If an unsaved, I mean, we're talking honesty. Are we real on the inside and outside? If an unsaved person put on a little helmet, could see what was going on in our mind, would, it, would they be drawn to the Savior or away? Those with honorable character and integrity, I believe they'd be drawn toward the Savior. So when he says what sort of things are honest, those things that have true, honorable character. Those are okay to think on. Those are, those are good things to think on. So, so um, let's check on it. Do the shows that we watch exemplify good, honorable character? Do they exemplify character traits that we, we believe would, would push people toward the Lord? The media that we consume, because we all consume media, and there's no way around it, but the articles that we read, the podcasts we listen to, the uh, messages we listen to, the, whatever, how's the character? How's the character? All right, whatsoever things are just. So whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. The word just means fair or right or righteous or faultless. Okay, so we're talking about something that is fair. And we all know what's not fair, Right? that that's not fair right all the time that's not fair we know that i'm telling you this we spend a lot of time thinking about things that aren't fair okay paul says no no let's think on some things that are fair that are just um and i'm going to try to boil it down but when we are saying that's not fair, where do you think we're, where do you think we're getting the, okay, so oh, this is a problem. Sometimes my thoughts, I can't really say them. <laughs> this is just a problem. Um, the, if we're judging something is fair or unfair, we've made ourselves the judge, right? We're saying we know all, we know all the details here. We've, we've piled up the yeas and the nays, and we are judging this is not fair. I, I'm just, we're putting ourselves in a pretty tall seat right there. When we start judging who, who, they didn't deserve that. Do we know? Do we know what people deserve? Well, let me, let me share. Go to, go to Proverbs 17. Proverbs 17. Um, because a, a lot of, People reject the Lord on the premise, well, this world is not fair. If, 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 how many times have you heard, if there was a God, why would he allow such and such to happen to these good people? Have you heard that? I've heard that so many times, I, I can't even remember how many times I've heard that. If, if, the, if God was fair, if there was a God, why, why would he allow these good people to go through this, that, or the other? Can I just help us? There are no good people. I mean, uh, let's just... I mean, I know... I'm not trying to be mean. You're good folks. But you're good because you got Jesus Christ in your heart. That's it. There's no good people. There's no... no. There are none good, no, not one. The only time that that actually happened was when it happened to Jesus. He's the only good person who something bad happened to. You see, if let's read the verse, Proverbs 17, verse 15. He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. So here's someone who's saying, Wicked person, go free. 
And here's someone who's saying, uh, honest person, you're condemned. The Lord says ab that's abomination to him because that's not justice, right? So picture this, Barabbas and Jesus. Um, Barabbas, for a certain sedition and murder, was going to be crucified. Jesus, who literally every trial he went to, they could find no fault. Even his enemy, Judas, said I, I, something like this, I want to be free of the blood of this just person, this just man. Even Judas admitted Jesus had no fault. But they let Barabbas go. And Jesus went to the cross. Well, why does the Bible include that story? Because I'm Barabbas. I'm, I'm the wicked. I, had, I should have been on that cross. I should, have, I, should be, I should be burning in hell for eternity. That's just. It's not just that the Son of God hung on the cross for my sins. That's opposite. I'm so glad he did. I'm just trying to explain, if we really want to boil down what's fair and unfair, that's where we're going to get. And then when we see all these, quote, injustices of our world, we put it next to that, they really don't hold much water. Now, I know, I understand that tragedies happen in this world. But those tragedies are the results of sin. They're the results of sin. Sin and sin and sin for the last 6,000 years has led us to a place of a tragic world with tragic things happening all the time. And, and by the way, it rains on the just and the unjust. So sometimes it's raining on us. Sometimes it ain't. Sometimes our wicked neighbor who re rejects Christ Sometimes good things happen to him, sometimes bad. Why? Because we live in a sin-sick world. Not because God doesn't exist or doesn't care. No, he, he came to the, the earth and, and, and did what in his own mind would have been abomination. And I don't mean to say he did something wrong. I'm saying, you know, that the, the fact that Jesus, the perfect and pure Son of God, would go die for us, that's, not a, that's two wrongs made a right. Me going free, him going to the cross, it was all in his plan. But when we think about whatsoever things are just, that's where we get. We get to the cross. And we get to what we really deserve. And what I've understood is, and I, listen, I'll, I'll still kick and cry like a baby all through life, I'm sure. But I'm telling you what God gives me is more than I've ever deserved. And I mean, I'm not telling you I'm going to be perfect on it. Next week when the tires are flat, I'm going to go, oh, 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 the tires are flat. And then I'm going to remember, I got more than I deserve. I deserve some flat tires. I'm just telling you. And probably much more than that. What we should think on is how glad we are God doesn't give us what is just. What is just? Okay, let's go on. Pure, lovely, good report. We're going to do these three kind of together. Let's go back to Philippians there. Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. Now these three are all as I studied them, I feel like they're very closely related, but they, uh, they deal with different aspects of, of this kind of the same thing. Purity deals with, and I think it's, it, I don't really have to preach it. This is something that's so easy to see. Purity deals with what is clean, chaste, virgin, undefiled, modest, immaculate. Those are some synonyms. Those are some things that purity deals with. Now, we could just pause right there and say, in agreement, 99% of the world's media does not pass the pure test. It just doesn't. I mean, most of what is out there, um, entertainment, you understand, is based on the opposite of purity. In our, in our society, 
Entertainment is based on the opposite of that. So, so we could, again, I, I, I would like, I mean, we could preach. I got 10 minutes left here. We could preach on some of those things, but I think it's pretty easy for us to see that literally everything Hollywood comes out with and everything we seem to find on, uh, on our social media feeds and every, I mean, everything, everywhere we look has a problem with purity. It's getting to where there's so few things you can involve yourself in. I mean, my, my wife and I have sat in front of the TV before and just turned, just been like, well, we're just going to turn it off. There's like literally nothing that, that passes the test. Pure, lovely, good report. So pure deals with clean, chaste, undefiled, modest, immaculate. Lovely deals with, similarly, but a little bit different, what exemplifies or beautifies. So you might say things that are acceptable or pleasing to God. What would, um, what would make um, lovely? What, so, so it's like, uh, <laughs> sometimes I don't know whether to tell a joke or not. And I'm enjoying my joke right now, and you don't know it yet. But there was a, uh, it's just us, right? Okay. There was a lady getting her picture taken, and she told the photographer, do me justice. He said, you don't need justice, you need mercy. And uh, that's not bad, you know. But it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> I started thinking about that because I was thinking, you know, lovely is adding, adding something that beautifies, um, makes something more pleasing. <laughs> So, so I was saying, then I, my mind went to makeup with the ladies, you know, and it's like, that just seems really rude. Um, I love building furniture. Let's go there. You got a raw piece of furniture. Some of you know this, you guys do that, and some others do this as well. Um, the lawn messes with cars a lot, and that is this going to apply there. But that, that raw piece of furniture, you know, it just built rough sawn. It looks good enough, but when you start applying that sandpaper to it, you really see the grain come out. Or you get a buffing cloth or whatever, you know, just apply it where you want. And then, you, you know, you, you work up through various levels of that sanding paper until you get to that really fine, and you can really see the grain. Then you put some stain on there, and it's like that wood comes alive. It was already there, but now it comes alive because it's picking up the, the different hues and the different streaks that are in the, the, the wood and, and then they got this stuff called paste wax that if you're real, you go and do some paste wax after the, all the finishing is done. And, he, and you can take a raw piece of wood that, you know, has looked okay. You can make it something wonderful just by adding some of these simple things. So these types of thoughts or these types of things are, are things which would add to, make more pleasing to God our thoughts. Um. I'm going to go to a good report because it's similar, and then we'll kind of wrap it all up and we'll go home. It goes along with that, which is of good report, um, because of good report is, is, um, carries with it the meaning of that which edifies or builds up, okay? That which edifies or builds up. Good report. Um, it's, a, it's a statement of praise to someone, a good report. And so you're building someone up with your, with your words. Well, this, these are thoughts then. These are types of thoughts that are building. They're, they're encouraging. They're edifying. They make more beautiful. Okay? Um, let, me, let me ask. The, the, the meat, again, we're going back to what we look at, what we listen to. Um, do those things build up your mind in the Lord or tear down? Do they give you, do they give you more peace and um, hope for the Lord? Or do they leave you with worry and, and question? Okay, there, there's certain types of media we, we can listen to, look at, whatever, that builds up the mind and gives us peace, helps us. There's other that causes us distress and worry. 
You ever watch something you thought, man, I wish I would never seen that? Yeah, sure, sure. Sometimes you can't avoid it, you know? Um, you know, I got a bunch of stuff written here. The value of, of good books. You know, good. There, there's things that you can read that build up the mind based out of the Scripture that will help you to build your thought life, give you things to think of that aren't tearing you down. So those three words put together is something like this, clean, beautiful, building. Thoughts that are clean, beautifying, and building. In other words, it's, it's not good enough just to get rid of bad thoughts. We've got to replace them with that which is good, that which is clean, that which is beautiful, that which is building. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. I'll read it to you for sake of time. It says, In these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So he's talking about the law of God being in their heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. I, I don't know how, you, there's no other way to say that, but that in every moment of the day, the law of God in our heart. I don't think any of us are perfectly got that one down yet. I'm just saying that's the goal. When we get up, it's the Lord. It's the law. Not, not the Old Testament law. You understand. The Word of God. Uh, when thou liest down, when you talk to your children, when, you're, when you rise up, good thoughts. And not just good thoughts, godly thoughts. Word of God thoughts. This is why, I mean, I, I talked about it a lot last week. Memorization. Bible reading, good, I mean, listening to, to preaching. I, I listen to a lot of preaching through the week via podcasts and, and other churches, that other preachers I like to listen to. I li listen to preaching. Those are, I mean, I'm telling you, it's, it's hard to have bad thoughts when you got some preacher in your ear. You know, it's just a good way to avoid bad thoughts. He'll build you up until you're down sometimes, then he'll build you back up. Good music. There's a lot of good things that we can, that can help us, build us, beautify our thoughts, rather than tearing us down. Because what we think is what we are. It's going to come out. So I'm going to give you three challenges, okay? Three challenges this week. Last week I challenged you to um, memorize Philippians 4a. If you haven't done that yet, that's, that's, that's still on it there. Just memorize Philippians 4a. Um. Then here's three challenges for you. How do we change our thoughts? Well, it's through the Word of God. Okay? So the Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, piercing even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the, what? Thoughts and intentions of the heart. So how do we change our thinking? We need more Word of God. We need more Bible. In all the forms. These days, you can listen to the Bible. You can read the Bible. You can listen and read the Bible. You can look at your phone and read the Bible, and it will read it to you. you there, we are without excuse, right? Okay, three challenges. Y'all don't have to do nothing I say. Okay? I'm the pastor. I'm just giving you, if you do this, it will help you. But it ain't going to be easy. Number one, spend time in God's Word before anything else every day this week. So before you go get your phone off the charger, go get your Bible off the bed. And I don't care if it's a verse or two or what. I, I promise you this, if you just read one, you'll read two. If you read two, you'll probably read four. And then you'll want to pray. I'm just saying before you do anything else, get your Bible out. If you read your Bible on your phone, you're cheating, but you can do that. It's fine. I actually read my Bible on my phone this weekend. We were traveling, and I, I just thought it would be easy to read it on my phone this weekend. So I did it. Sorry. Preach against it all the time. The reason that the Bible on the phone bothers me is because, you know, you're sitting there trying to read your Bible, and what happens? Notifications. All in your face. And I just don't like that. But anyway, rabbit trail big time. God's Word before anything else this week, okay? Here's a real hard one. Real hard. Spend more time in his word than any other source of media. Just try to do it for one day. Just try it. Now, that's hard. 
You say, what do you mean? Um, if you're going to scroll Facebook for an hour, I want you to read for an hour and one minute in your Bible or listen to a sermon or, you know, more media in the Word of God, reading, memorization, listening to the Bible, listening to preaching, more of that than any other media in the day. Now, that's hard. You know why that's hard? The average person checks their phone more than 300 times a day. The average person picks up their phone and looks at it. I wonder if anyone cares about me. 300 times a day. I just looked at mine. Guess what? I had a notification. I got to put it in my pocket. No, we check our phones all the time. Have you ever been insulted when it tells you how much screen time you have? Mine Sunday at 922, every Sunday morning, 922. Your screen time was up so and so percent. You spend this much time. And I go, what? No way. And then I say, it's because I'm listening to all that preaching and it's counting it. I don't know what it is. Hours a day we spend on media. Minutes, seconds a day we give to the Lord. I'm just saying, flip it for a couple days this week. Try it. Intentionally be like, today, more Bible than anything else. I know that's probably impractical for every single day, although I feel like we probably could do it. Just a couple days. Pick a couple days. Do that. Okay, here's another thing. Even harder. Two days this week, do a media fast. Nothing electronic. No phone. Now, someone calls you. I don't want anyone call. Well, I had an emergency, and I couldn't answer my phone because the preacher. No. Call. Yep. Just no, no social media, no YouTube, no whatever, whatever it is for you. No TV, no Disney Plus, just media fast, two days. It'll be so hard. Just try it. If you do all that this week, I promise you, you'll see some spiritual fruit. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. God, if you're in God's word more than you're in the world, I'm just telling you, stuff starts to happen. So I just, I challenge you, try it. Try some of those things. If you can't do them all, try one, try two. I try, and, and, and I really want to be practical, give you some things, put some handles on some, some things. How can we do this? I, I'm, I'm on social media daily, usually, daily. I'll do the same, all right? I'll pick some days. I'll get off. We'll do it together, okay? How we think. We'll, we'll, we'll finish this little series on how we think up next week. Actually, two weeks from now. Next week, you're going to be here hearing Brother Bigger. All services, right? Plan it out. Put it on your calendar. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody talk you out of it. Just try to be here. You will be blessed by Brother Bigger. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, if, if I could hang out with him every day, I would. I got to have, uh, he, he went to Israel with me. I went to Israel with him. Let's say it like that. I went to Israel with him, and I was at his hip most of the time. He's just such a great man. Going to enjoy having him. So that'll be next week. Then we'll finish this up. Let's pray. Lord, um, thank you for thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for your word and helping us, Lord. And, and I do believe we live in a time that's just an extremely difficult time to be a good thinker. There's so many influences. A lot of it's unavoidable in our day. But help us, Lord, to just, just make some intentional decisions to get out of some of this stuff and get more into your word. And however you lead us to do that, Lord, I do believe it'll help us. So I pray you'd help us this week, all of us, to just do a better job of curbing our thinking and, and filtering our thinking through your word. Thank you for all that you've done today and you continue to do for us. Lord, bless us as we leave. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.